Now, inside every single bottle of wine across the planet is the fermented juice of hundreds of these little things we call grapes. Uh, and for every grape in each bottle across the entire planet, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of factors that influenced how that grape turned out that year before they ever even picked it and squeezed out its juice to make it into wine. Uh, factors like the general climate of the area where the vineyard's located, the more specific climate, and that would be called the microclimate of the vineyard itself, and specifically within the microclimate, what the weather was that year, because that changes day to day, month to month, year to year. Things like the rain, the humidity, the sunshine, how many overcast days there were, the wind, the frost, the elevation, the slope of the hills, the way that the wind came in, the drainage of the area, the dew that formed. So much goes into just the weather that's very variable in each vineyard. There's also things like the soils, the underlying bedrock, which goes into the nutrient and, and mineral composite of what's going on in the soil that goes into the plant. Also, how the vines were planted, how the vines were spaced, how they were pruned, how they were irrigated, the fertilizers that were used, the herbicides that were used, the pesticides that were used, how they weeded in between the rows. All of this affects things. Also, how and when the grapes were harvested, how the wine was processed, if the wine was blended, or aged, or etc., or etc., or etc. There are literally thousands of other considerations and relationships that I don't even fully understand myself, but the most crucial influence on the flavors, aromas, and the body of that finished wine is this one crucial little thing. That is, which grape variety went into the bottle? Which grapes did you use? And all of the other things that I just listed go into how good is the grape that particular year. Now, there's an old saying in the wine world, especially among top-rated winemakers, that all great wines start in the vineyard. And there is a lot of truth to that, meaning that if it, any one of these factors is horrifically bad that year, then you're probably not going to make a great wine. You can make a good wine. A great winemaker can take grapes that are just meh, or just okay, or that weren't that great, and he can make a decent wine out of that, maybe even a good one. But everyone agrees, when you get those awesome wines, spectacular, great wines, they must have great fruit from a great year. In other words, it's the base constituent. Consider winemakers like chefs. Uh, if a chef in the kitchen has mediocre ingredients and a piece of meat that's been uh, rotten for the last week, a great chef can make something out of that, but it ain't going to be a great meal. When a great chef gets great ingredients and puts them together under his great skills, then you have fantastic meals. And that's the way wine is too. So the base element is what's going on in the vineyard? How do you get great grapes to turn into great wines? You know what? Let's do that. Let's get into the vineyard now and learn more about grapes. Now, I've already told you in the previous lecture that wine is the fermented juice of any fruit. Any fruit. I'm going to go ahead and give you the heads up here. 99% of it's made out of this one fruit called grapes. But any fruit, that is anything that's not grain or those other crazy things like succulents. And there are, of course, tons and tons and tons of fruits you enjoy it all on a daily basis. There's peaches and plums and nectarines and mangoes and pineapples and lemons and limes and grapes. Now, before we get to the grape wine stuff, have you seen other fruit wines out there? Because they're kind of... Uh, uh, making a little bit of a renaissance right now here in America. I've seen uh, blackberry wines, raspberry wines, strawberry wines. Those are typically more dessert style wines. But I've seen peach wine as well. That's even on the dry side. Uh, there is a long standing tradition in Great Britain of making wine out of pears, and it's actually called Perry, P E R R Y. And it's very kind of wine-like in that it's dry, not so much super sweet. You may have had plum wine out of Japan. I actually think it's more of a Chinese thing. The one fruit wine that i positive you've at least heard of, if not tried, is apple wine. Except for some reason, we don't call apple wine apple wine. We call it apple cider. I mean, you take the juice of an apple and you ferment it into an alcoholic beverage. That's wine. 
But we'll call it cider in America for reasons that no one understands too well. We call it hard cider. Everywhere else in the world, you just know it's alcoholic cider made out of apples. In America, it's hard cider. So there are lots of fruits in lots of different places that are made into wine. However, we most often say that wine is the fermented juice of this one particular fruit called grapes. So what's so special about grapes? Well, a lot of us, myself included, would say that grapes are nature's perfect little package. Perfect, perfect bundle of sugar and taste and goodness. And a grape is any fruit of, the, of a vine, okay? So unlike, say, apple or oranges, grapes go on, grow on vines, woody vines. And uh, uh, the grape is the fruit of any vine in the family Vitaceae and the genus Vitis. And they are commonly eaten raw. You've had grapes, just table grapes, we call them. Uh, you can make uh, grapes into juice, squeeze out the juice and just drink it straight without fermentation. You can make that stuff into jelly. You can dry them out and make them into raisins. And of course, for our interest, you can ferment the heck out of it and make it into wine. Because the consumption of all of the products I just named is extremely high the world over, grapes, I've seen figures like grapes constitute 50% of all the fruit grown in the world. Now, I, I'm not gonna test you on that. I don't think I can verify it. I'm not even sure it's true, but I see it in a lot of places. I don't know if that means it's the most acreage, it's the, the fruit under the most acreage, or 50% of the acreage of fruit in the world, or if it's by pounds. I don't know, because there are other really big fruits in terms of production and poundage, things like bananas and apples. If grapes is not the number one most planted fruit on planet Earth, it's certainly in the top two or three. So it's a really big deal, and it's because it's so versatile. It's a versatile little fruit that you can do all of these things I've mentioned. So there are a lot of countries on planet Earth that don't even drink wine, but they're huge producers of grapes, namely a lot of Islamic countries where the grapes are originally from, but I'll get back to that in a later lecture. So huge amounts of grapes eaten raw, huge amounts dried out into raisins, a very storable way you can do uh, uh, keep this... Uh, grape stuff around for the whole year, and not many other fruits are storable. They pretty much rot right away. Uh, and unlike a lot of other uh, uh, fruits, this one makes a whole heck ton of wine on planet Earth. All right, well, let's break it down. What's so special about this particular uh, fruit that makes it the number one used fruit for wine? Let's do some basic plant components. I know this is a little kind of on the horticulture, biologic side, but it, trust me, it will help you understand wine and appreciate wine a lot more if you understand the awesomeness that is the grape. So the basic parts here, and just a very basic figure, uh, uh, and the basic parts and what they contribute to wine in particular. I'm not going to deal too much with uh, table grapes and things of that nature. So when it comes to grapes, skins. Skins are the area, this the very surface of skin, just like the skin on your body, it's the surface covering. The thing that's important about grapes when we're talking about wine though is the skin contains virtually all the color that goes into the finished wine, virtually all the color. Little heads up on this as well, but almost all fruit juice, 99.999% of, uh, of, I'm sorry, grape juice, when you squeeze any grape, no matter what color it is, green grape, white grape, uh, red grape, black grape, if you squeeze it, uh, the juice that comes out is clear. So how do we have so many different colored wines? Ah, because the skin colors are different and the color of the wine comes all from the skin, not from the juice. So the skins add uh, a ton of color, a lot of these things called tannins, and they actually naturally harbor bacteria and yeast, which is why wine will naturally ferment when you just squeeze them up and let them go on their own. The yeast are hanging out there. The insides of the grapes contain what we call seeds, but the better technical term is pips. Pip, pip, cheerio. A grape seed is actually a pip. And the pips are the seeds, and actually the stems, the woody parts that hold the little grape in place there, uh, contain uh, also more of these tannins, uh, a whole bunch of oils, which aren't so really great, so you don't kind of want them in your wine, and a lot of bittering components contained in those oils and those tannic components of the pips and stems. Now, everything else that I have not mentioned yet is what you think of as the grape, the part that you actually kind of eat, and that is the pulp. And in the pulp or the juice, uh, pretty important for the wine, that's what you're gonna get the stuff, which contains tons of sugars, 
acids, water, flavors, and even this thing called pectins, which I will not get into because I don't understand it fully myself. Now, before we go any deeper into which type of grapes, that was a very brief sketch of, yeah, here are the parts of the grape and why they're important to wine. Let's go one level deeper and look at the typical composition of a wine grape in terms of what's there. I've named the things, but let's look at it in terms of some percentages. If you take any single wine grape, and there are literally millions, if not billions, of these little suckers harvested every year to make wine, uh, each little grape, on average, will be about 75% water. Typical of a lot of fruits. However, unlike many other uh, fruits around planet Earth, it's about 22 or perhaps even up to 25% sugars. Boom, let me stop the grape train right there and suggest to you that's one of the major reasons why grapes are so awesome and why they're the number one pick to be made into wine. They have the highest ratio or percentage by volume of sugars to the rest of the fruit. Yes, there are many other fruits you've had that taste super sweet. And some fruits are in this uh, upper tier of super levels of sugar and sweetness. Uh, things like mangoes pretty much up there. But if you think bananas are super sweet, they've actually got like half the amount of sugars per unit volume uh, that uh, grape does. So tremendous amounts of sugars in there, and that's the stuff we need to make alcohol. So that's why they're so important. Other very com uh, important components of grapes in each little grape package is acids. Now, the acids don't comprise really a whole heck of a lot when you're looking at the percentage breakdown, but it's got about 0 0.6, 0 0.6, just over half a percent of something called tartaric acid, about a half a percent of something called malic acid, and maybe some other scattered things like citric acid that are in very trace amounts. So you're looking at just over a percent or so of acids, but it's crucial, crucial, crucial that wine grapes have these particular acids and in at this level, which is actually kind of high. Bananas don't got none of these acids and no, neither do a whole lot of other fruits. There are now, listing off the rest of this typical grape composition, something called nitrogenous matter, phenolics, minerals, other matter, just a couple of percent of these things all put together. And that is pretty typical of all wine grapes, and actually most table grapes all over planet Earth is that breakdown. Okay, so what? So I've got some figures now, 75% water of 22, 23, 24% sugar, and trace amounts of acids and some other things. Write this stuff down too. I've now pointed out sugars are super important because that's the stuff that gets turned into alcohol and significantly high levels of alcohol when you start comparing wine to beers, where a typical beer only gets up to four or six percent alcohol because there's only so much available sugar in grain. Wine can get up to 13, 14, 15, 16 percent alcohol by volume. That's pretty significant. Other fruits cannot get up that high because they don't have that level of sweetness either. The acids that I pointed out, tartaric acid brings the tart flavor to the wine. It also lowers pH to a point that prevents many uh, bacteria from existing that spoil wine. So it's, in essence, a preservative, a natural preservative. And grapes, jot this down too, Grapes have a higher level of tartaric acid than any other thing on planet Earth. It makes them very distinct. Very high sugars, and even though it's like 0.6%, very high levels of tartaric acid compared to any other fruit. And it's a natural preservative. pa -bam. It does also provide stability and is the backbone for wines, flavors, and color profile. So tartaric acid kind of think of it, and I'll say this probably a hundred more times uh, in this semester, tartaric acid is kind of like the spine of the wine. And all of the flavors and colors and all the components and phenolics and other things are hung on that spine. So you can have a whole bunch of stuff in the wine, but without that tartaric acid backbone, it's kind of like bleh, flab, like thinking about your old body just without your spine. It's just not, not much there. That's how important tartaric acid is. The other acid that I mentioned was malic acid. It's an acid that gives you a, the tart, lights up the side of your tongue, a green apple flavors. And it can be converted to another acid, which is even softer and brings other elements to wine. 
leave that for another lecture too. The last thing I wanted to point out that I've mentioned so far is this stuff called tannins. Tannins are a poly, uh, polyphenolic compound. I don't expect you to be able to pronounce or know polyphenolic compound, but it's responsible for this thing we call astringency. That's what you feel when you drink a really tannic red wine, especially a young, tannic, big, bold red wine, and it dries out your mouth, gives you that mouth pucker feel. It's not tart, tart's a flavor. This is a, 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 a feeling, not a flavor. It's the same uh, thing that happens to your mouth if you ever drank black tea. So other uh, uh, fruits and other things have tannins in them. And they all do this one thing to your mouth. And if you want to, again, try this without having to get confused by tasting the flavors of the wine, get a, a black tea, a Chinese black tea, and steep it. Make a super strong a cup of black tea and just without any cream or sugar or nothing and just drink it. Even though you're drinking a liquid, it will <clears throat> dry your mouth out. That's the tannic component. The grape has all of these things in levels much higher than any other fruit and that makes them super awesome for wine production in particular. Okay, let me back it up then. Let's summarize and add in a few more ele elements. Why is the grape nature's perfect package when it comes to alcoholic production and wine production? High sugar content, 20 to 25%. Boom, translates into a lot of alcohol. Alcohol, oh, by the way, is also a, a preserving agent. So when you start looking around at other fruits to make into wine, they'll have lower levels of alcohol, they have lower levels of everything else, they spoil fairly quickly. So high sugar content equals higher alcohol content. I haven't even mentioned something very physical. Grapes are super awesome because you can get the juice out of them super easy. Think about it. How do you get grape juice? You just squeeze and the stuff drips out. How do you get apple juice? Yeah, you got actually have apples and kind of smash them with a hammer and strain them and push them and then you've got all this busted up mush and you got to get juice out of it. It's a much more complicated affair and that's true with a lot of other, if not all the other fruits as well. So extremely extractable juice uh, when it comes to grapes. I'll compare one other one. Bananas. Have you ever drank banana juice? Do you know why you've never drank banana juice? Go try to get banana juice. <laughs> it's super hard because it's locked up in this turchy pulp. I don't know what the hell a banana is. I mean, they taste great, but try to squeeze a banana. What happens? And nothing comes out. Put it in a blender. It turns into paste. So bananas got sugar and they taste good, but you can't get the juice out, at least not easily. So easy juice extraction. I already also outlined the awesome acid profile of the typical wine grape. And that is higher tartaric acid than any other fruit. That tartaric stuff is awesome as a preservative for wine. It adds body. It's the backbone that holds up the flavors. And there's another uh, acid. Malic acid is important too, but not as important as tartaric. But there's another acid that is actually not in grapes so much, and it is in a lot of other fruits. And it's awesome for grapes that it doesn't have a lot. And that would be citric acid. Citric acid? What, what fruits have citric acid? I don't know, maybe the citrus family. And the citrus family, uh, uh, apples, uh, lemons, limes, pineapples, kiwi. Anything that's got that super tart woo, flavor to it uh, is in the citrus family. And yeast don't seem to like that stuff too much. It's an acid that it's good. It's actually good for you, I guess. But it's not great to ferment because yeast don't dig it, which is why, even though any fermented fruit juice is wine, you probably ain't never seen lemon wine, have you? You probably ain't never seen uh, lime wine or pineapple wine. It's h much harder to pull those off. So while grapes have very trace amounts of citric acid, it's not enough to stymie the process. And actually during the fermentation process, wine gets rid of all citric acid quite naturally on its own. Make sense? I might back it up to the sugar content one too and talk about some other fruits that ain't so great. Watermelons. Watermelons, they taste sweet, right? Yeah, they have hardly any sugar. They're most all water, which is why you don't see watermelon wine either. 
So grapes just keep stacking up all the positives. The final positive is that they have those tannin things and other phenolics that serve as preservative and taste components that actually have positive health benefits as well. So we're not exactly sure why, and phenolics is just a fancy word for chemical combinations of things. And wine, because it's made from grape juice, has all these interesting phenolic combinations and stuff that we don't even fully understand yet, which is why we say, oh, the tannic stuff and this phenolic stuff, they're like heart healthy. Why? We don't know. <laughs> I love that. I love that we actually don't have all the answers yet when it comes to things like this. I'll tell you another beverage that has tons of wacky phenolics in it that's actually probably super good for you too is coffee. And, and you think, oh, coffee, coffee's awesome. I drink coffee and because it has caffeine, it does all this crazy stuff, it makes me feel good. And researchers have already kind of figured out, no, it ain't really just the caffeine. The caffeine has a certain stimulant effect on you, but there's all these other phenolics in coffee that we don't even understand that are doing stuff to you too. So grape has this phenolic component, tannic component, awesome acid profile, high sugar concentration, easy to extract all that awesome juice. And the Vitaceae family and the genus Vitus are prolific across the entire northern half of planet Earth. Another super bonus, naturally, by the way. Pre-human civilization, these particular plants that make this particular fruit that we call grapes are all over the place. And each one of these plants, all and there are tons of species all over the Northern Hemisphere from North America, all the way down to Mexico and Central America, all across Eurasia, all the way down in the Middle East, tons of different species of this particular plant. And all of them have these interesting sugar acid tannic combinations. But, there's always a but, isn't there? But hold on, because we don't hardly use any of those other species at all. We actually, of the perhaps hundred or so different species of this one plant, we only use one for 99.9% .9 of all wine production. And this one is called Vitus vinifera, the actual species name. Huh, well, why is that? You just said all of them have all these great things. Why do we only use one species from one particular part of planet Earth to make almost all the wine you've ever seen? Well, to understand that, we need to talk about the different type of grapes, and let's do that now. <laughs> 